This webinar is on 3D modeling and I've chosen a flower pot design. It's a spring theme for our lovely spring weather of snow, hail, sleet, rain, sun, frost, and flowers. It's a way to learn geometry, coding, and design um, with a very simple project, but as you'll see, not so simple. There's a lot to it and uh, you can really play with, with the files I'm going to send you or create your own. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sheila Crawford Bunch, Director of Education for NC Lab. This webinar series is made possible by a Nevada State Library, Archives, and Public Records Continuing Education grant funded by the Institute for Museum and Library Services through the Library Services and Technology Act. NC Lab is a self-contained desktop platform where you can learn and use computer programming, modeling, and many other STEM skills. You learn through self-paced and self-graded courses. Apply the skills using the apps in Creative Suite, and we'll be using two of them today. And uh, then, really, we're focusing on play with this webinar. We want to let ourselves play with our skills before we dive into a high-stakes project. And this is one way to do it. You're welcome to follow along, open your desktop, or when you go through this as the recorded version, uh, then you can pause it at any point and try out some of these skills yourself. We're going to start off by going over the, the purpose of the exercise. We're going to link it to some educational standards, go over design principles, look at our coding tools, run through some 3D printing basics, and uh, get a little inspiration for our design. And then we'll go through coding a flower pot using Plasm, which is the 3D modeling app. And then coding a flower pot using the Python Turtle app with a little Plasm thrown in because they do work together. We'll go through preparing, printing, and finishing the 3D printed plots and plan an event. So this is a little bit more formally written as an objective. We're going to design a flower pot using functional and aesthetic criteria within time, cost, and technology limits of coding and 3D printing. And notice if I have bolded certain words. It is a design cycle. We are using various criteria. That's an important part of design. And we're working within our limits. We're going to experiment with some short programs and I'm going to send you a spreadsheet with links to files that you can use. And then we're going to test our 3D prints based on different STL files. I had a lot of fun doing this myself and I think you will too. And I have learned from my experiences and improved my methods and a lot of you have already used 3D printers and you have earned some sweat equity there yourself. I put in links to webinars where we have gone over 3D modeling and printing before. And we also did those pendants with the Python turtle. And also an exercise in designing a wallet under the preparing students for 21st century jobs. So these are all resources that you can blend with this one if you like. Your participants can come in with zero experience and just play with the files provided. They need just a little bit of guidance, but once they start plugging in numbers and seeing different results, uh, they'll have fun. And uh, they can export anything reasonable and, and print it. If your participants are taking the courses, this is a great opportunity to try out some coding skills, and I'll show you some examples. And of course, the courses we're talking about are Visual Intro to Python, you may remember this as uh, Tina Turtle, uh, the Python Turtle, and also Python 1. And we finally settled on visual intro to Python because really you're starting to learn how to code in Python, but with visual results. And in the Turtle program, we're really working like a G code or something you would send to a lathe. We're drawing a line and then rotating it around the y-axis. And this skill is taught in section 10 of unit 2 if you want to reference the course. 3D modeling, we're going to build the flower pot using both 2D and 3D shapes and uh, 
we're drawing skills from all over the course, including the very last unit. And I mentioned that specifically because if you want to look up axial rotation, that's where that is taught, is in section 21. Hey, why do we want to bother with standards? Well, K-12 schools use standards to anchor their curriculum, and libraries are often collaborating with schools. I use two sets of standards when it comes to computer science. One is developed by the Computer Science Teachers Association and the other by the International Society for Technology and Education. There are other sets of standards, but these two are quite current and used by a lot of states. And since we're doing engineering, so to speak, we're also going to reference the next generation science standards and really NGSS one of their major emphases was to get students to start thinking like engineers. Computer science standards from CSTA are broken down by grade band and you can think, think of that as age band. Um, for kinders you are doing a lot of things that might be either offline or you just apply the these ideas to a simple sequence of events with goals and expected outcomes and really you're getting them to do a bit of planning so even if they use some simple code on the computer or don't do any coding at all or just watch uh, you can engage them in the planning process they're pretty bright and creative and same thing with your your kids who are age 8 to 10 they're really good at manipulating the programs and punching in different numbers and getting some ideas on what they could do with it. By the time they're in middle school, sixth to eighth grade, they are um, expected to take existing code and work it into an original program. And of course, they're supposed to say where they got it from. We don't plagiarize, we give attribution. But uh, this is very common in software development to take existing code. People share it on places like GitHub and modify it into what you need to do. We, we, we're all building on each other's experience. By high school age and older, we're really thinking ahead. We're designing and developing artifacts. The iteratively term there refers to, we go through a number of cycles to really refine it and make something that's gonna meet all our criteria within all our constraints. ISTE talks about innovative designer, and again, you start seeing these terms come up in different sets of standards, it's a deliberate design process. Uh, we're using digital tools. We're building prototypes as part of a cyclic design process. And again, in NGSS, they break it down into the three steps. The, the first one is really a planning and thinking process. We're thinking about our criteria for success and our constraints or limits. And then they really encourage you to try different solutions and then evaluate which one works best. We're testing or refining our prototypes and the cycle goes back on itself. All of these have links to the original documents. So let's look at our project. Well, we're making miniature flower pots. And why are we making miniature flower pots? Well, we may actually be using them as flower pots. This is highly functional. We might put in uh, uh, microgreens, for example, or start some seeds in them. And if we're gonna use them that way, then our criteria are something like this. They, we want them to be waterproof. They need to be open to light and they should have good drainage and they should be sturdy. We're gonna use them over time and we wanna make sure they hold up. We could make miniature flower pots as purely decorative items. And in that case, we want them to be visually pleasing. Uh, we may need them to be able to hold some gravel or something as a support for what, whatever we put in there, say silk flowers or something. You need that counterbalance. So your flower pot or vase has to be functional in that sense. It, it needs to be able to handle that. Uh, we might be giving them as gifts, so you might personalize them and add initials or symbols or colors. That's a little more advanced programming, but it's possible. And we're also doing them for our own learning. We're learning about the design process. We're practicing our coding and 3D modeling 
and our 3D printing skills. Constraints. Well, we always have constraints that are provided by the customer. There's usually a, a deadline. And because there's a deadline, we have to develop a timeline to meet that deadline. Uh, they may be involved in improving different steps or if nothing else, approving the initial idea and the final product. And we may have a budget. So they may have a million dollar idea and give you a $10,000 budget, but then we have to make the project fit. There's two main processes involved. We have a coding process, so we are constrained by what our software can do and can't do. And same thing with the 3D printer. We have the, the hardware itself and what it's able to do, but we also have to consider time. 3D printing is a very time consuming process. And uh, so we're gonna work within that constraints. We, we may have access to only certain types of materials and not others. So we have to think in terms of materials and what the printer is capable of doing. And we also have to bring in the constraint of our own expertise. If we have very little training, we're not gonna be able to produce something elaborate. It'll be within our limits of training experience and also what team is available to us. And this is very real life. You may have some people who are expert on the printer, some people who are expert on coding, some people who are expert on design, and you work together to produce a product. Learn from each other. Even if you're all doing your own projects, you can learn from each other. There's a little graphic on the process, and that's basically taking those design principles, and, and this is exactly what we are going to be doing. We're gonna design, we're gonna write or modify some code, export some STL files for printing. Then we're gonna slice, print, and post-process the 3D prints, evaluate, modify, and repeat as needed. And finally, we'll finish our products and present them. And again, that word iterative, the steps are repeated as the design is refined. Our coding tools that we have available to us, we can code it in either the Python Turtle app, and you'll find that under Programming, or the Plasm app, which you'll find under 3D Modeling, and those are both in Creative Suite. And there's an example of the Python Turtle app. We're writing lots of code and running it and producing this image in the viewer. And uh, to the right, I've shown a picture of what it looks like in 2D. So there's the turtle drawing away with a nice thick line. And that thickness is important in this case because it's going to form the thickness of the wall of the pot. We want to make sure we save our, our file in the program menu so we can use it again. And then to get it to the printer, we go over to the viewer menu under export and save the STL file to disk because you're gonna either share it by email or you might have a thumb drive that you take to the person helping you with slicing it or you put the thumb drive straight into the printer itself. You can also save those files in NC Lab in your My Files folder for the future. Then the other tool is Plasm, and Plasm's used quite differently than the turtle. We're building it from shapes, and you notice I've used all these different colors, and that's not gonna print out like that. Um, you can get printers these days that will do multi colors, but our program, will, when it exports the STL file, there's no colors assigned. You would assign them in the slicer for that printer. What's handy here is that each color represents a different part of the code. And so I can see how my code is behaving by color coding my results. And it's, it's a very useful technique. Uh, our other coding tools are the courses themselves. And you'll find that in the course menu called Visual Intro, Intro to Python for the Turtle Course. Section 10 is where we teach how to build the rotational solids themselves. 3D modeling course, really you're gonna be using information from all of the units. Um, you'll learn how to extrude 2D shapes in unit one. 
Unit two and three, you learn how to build actual 3D shapes. Unit four is where you start manipulating those, those shapes with more advanced commands. You might start using Python lists to do repeated shapes. And then unit five is where you build rotational solids and use Bezier curves. File saving. This is kind of important. Every file program has its idiosyncrasies. And whenever you build a file, make sure you save it first because after that it starts to auto save. So if you give it a different file name, then it knows it's saving to that file. You can save it, you can open it from my files and keep working. And if you get to a point where you go, hey, I like this design, I don't want to mess with it any further then if you want to keep experimenting, save your file to a different file name before you make changes. Otherwise, the auto save will just overwrite your original file. A nice trick, and this is just the same old command you use in, in uh, word processing and everything else, Control Z will undo your steps while you're working live. So if you start, you went, oh man, I wanted to save that file and I forgot you can control Z back to the point where you wanted to save it, save it, and then go forward again. 3D printing basics. Well, we have three parts to it. We slice, and then we print, and then we finish. The slicing software, you might have a standalone program. Um, with the makerspace here, one of the slicing programs they use is called Cura, C-U-R-A. And most printers actually come with some built-in slicing software. The reason why it's called a slicer is it's, it's preparing the layers that are going to be printed because the way it works in most cases is that you build a layer on an XY plane and then you move the plane and build another layer and so forth until the whole thing is built. This is where you get to scale your print. So you build it in your in NC Lab um, and you have a scale there just to keep all your components scaled to each other. But this is where you scale it for printing. So you can take the same design and make it super tiny. You can make it large. You can make copies of it. So if you want to make 10 pots all the same, you just copy your STL file over and over again with your slicer. This is where you position files for printing and you set information for the printer. And you can even save your slice file usually. When you're printing, make sure you have read the instructions from the printer manufacturer. There's maintenance for, involved, and the maintenance is ongoing maintenance for the machine itself, and there's also procedures for setting up uh, before you start and after you finish. And that includes cleaning and prepping the platform and the nozzle, and keeping an eye on the print run, especially at the beginning. It typically, the most mess ups occur at the beginning of the print run, so you don't want to walk away and go have lunch. You want to hang out and make sure at least get started correctly. And then after you finish printing, there's always some post printing jobs to clean up the prints. You might need a water bath. And then after you're all done, you might uh, sand it or seal it, paint it, and so forth. So here's a visual for you. There's slicer on the left, and there's the prints being generated. And there's a homemade water bath with a Pyrex measuring cup and a, a bowl on top to make sure everything's underneath the water. So pots. Well, we have these internet search tools, and this is a great way just to go browse and see what's out there for different shapes and maybe some ideas on what you, how you might decorate it afterward. And I've included Ikebana. It's a very different way of arranging flowers. And the dishes that you use in Ikebana are quite different than the normal flower pot shape. So I would uh, search on both those terms and you're gonna find some interesting ideas. All right, so let's go start building a flower pot. And first we're gonna use Plasm. And I just made a little comment on the side here. When you're writing code, you always want to document it because it's not just for other people, but for yourself. You go back and you can't remember what part of your code did what. If you write some comments in, it's really easy to go back and, and monitor your own progress. And there's two ways to comment. 
you can just put a pound sign in front of the line and you'll see it gray out and that's a line by line way of commenting and then you can also create this nice long story using what we call doc strings and those are just single quotes repeated three times at the beginning and end of your doc string doc strings have a lot of other applications but we won't go into those today this is how Plasm works, is you create objects, you give them a name, and then you use a keyword, and the keyword calls a function. So this keyword says, hey, we want to build a ring, and the inside diameter, or radius I should say, is going to be 0.5, and the outside radius is going to be 3. And those are any kind of units. The, Eventually, you can translate them into millimeters or centimeters or inches. These are just internally related to each other. Once you have a ring, then you can use this command called prism and turn it into a 3D object, which is going to have a different name. And that'll use this other object as a base and then give it a height. In this case, we're making it 0.5. And like I said, I, I've been color coding these just so when I render them in the viewer, I can distinguish which what part is doing what. I've used something called a truncated cone to build the walls. It's narrow at the bottom and, and broader at the top. And I create these walls by subtracting an inner wall from an outer wall and that creates my classic pot wall. The top rim, I'm going to use a tube command, and I want it to be a little thicker than the walls. This gives makes your pot sturdy and it keeps it from collapsing. So instead of 0.5 as a dimension a thickness, I'm using one. The footings, I, I put feet under my pot so that when water drains out, it's not just sitting and rotting the bottom of the pot it has somewhere to go. And I just made little cylinders and moved them into position. And uh, once you've made one cylinder that you like, you can have all the other cylinders you're gonna use just be a copy of that. So if you go, whoops, you know what? I made that too big or too small. You only have to change one line and then all these other ones are just gonna make a copy of that. And just to make it easy to move the whole package around, I create a union that's just putting all these objects into one place. It's like uh, grouping them. You can think of it as grouping. And I make an object called footings. And then I can use that uh, for my display. In the viewer, you can use different views to check your design. You can select those from the menu. And here I've shown an isometric view. And this is nice for seeing uh, the pot in 3D. And then I show a top view, and that's where you can see looking down, you know, the, the outside rim on the top and the drain hole on the bottom. And then looking up from the bottom, this is something I can use to check the position of my, my footings. I also want to make sure that my pieces all join, that there's no gaps. Um, your SCL file is not going to like it if there's air between one shape and another shape. So for a square pot, I'm just going to add one parameter and I'll show you this in more detail. Uh, when you're making a ring or a circle or a tube, those are all based on a regular polygon with a lot of sides. That's all a circle is to the computer program. It's just a, a regular polygon with lots and lots of sides, enough sides that it looks smooth. Well, we can mess with that and make all kinds of neat shapes by adding an additional parameter. And you can see I've added four to all these lines and now I have a square pot and that's what it looked like when it was printed out. And there's just a, a little enlargement of that same code. Um, it's an optional parameter. It's something that the program already knows when it makes a circle, um, but we can override it. And it's always the last parameter uh, on these particular commands. Okay, so we're gonna make a lovely curved pot here. And this is this particular set of commands that you learn in the very last unit. 
And, but they're not as different. It sounds, oh yeah, last unit, it's gotta be really hard. It is not hard. So let's take a look at that code a little deeper. The first thing you do is create a set of points or a list of points and those square brackets means we have, mean that we have a list. And uh, we define each point using the point keyword. And the very first point and the very last point are where the curve is gonna be anchored on your drawing. You can put one point in between which will pull the curve towards it or you can put several points and get a quite a wavy line out of it. So in this case, I just put one point in. And these are fun to experiment with. You can make some really cool uh, wall shapes with um, a set of points. Uh, once you have a set of points, then you're going to rotate that using the row shell command and the shell, it, we're gonna tell it to have a thickness of 0.5 and we want to make it a full circle, go all 360 degrees. And it's gonna rotate it around the Y axis. And if we want it to stand up nice and neat on the X, Y plane and line up on the Z axis, then we're just gonna rotate that wall 90 degrees about the X axis and that will stand it up. You'll find your slicer software will also do this for you if you forget. Okay, so uh, I talked about Ikebana, and this is a very different way to make a little pot. Um, when you're doing Ikebana, you're gonna have weighted metal frogs, maybe. They're, they're a set of spikes that you stick the flowers into, or you might have gravel or stones. So you wanna make a fairly sturdy container that'll hold that weight. In this case, I made a base, and I'm gonna expand that code, show you that in a little more detail. So I, I used a rectangle this time, and a rectangle, of course, is length times width, so that's six times four. And there's that optional parameter again, and in this case, it's rounding the corners. So that's all it's doing. I'm giving it a radius of one to round my corners. And then I'm building my 3D shape using that base and the prism command to give it the height. The uh, walls, I first start by creating a ring. And in this case, I decided to make it 12-sided. It's a dodecahedral polygonal ring. Then I'm gonna use this really cool command called scale. So I'm gonna take my nice round ring and squash it. And I've decided to, to make X 1.5 times longer than Y. And that's exactly what I'm telling it in the scale command. I'm gonna scale that polygon 1.5 in the X direction. And then I'll make a prism out of it and I've got my nice wall. So this back up, you can see how that looks over in the viewer. All right, so let's take a look at slicing the files. I decided I'm gonna use some green colored PLA and PLA is what you will all have with your library printers. It's very inexpensive, safe to use. The most uh, standard printers uh, at libraries and schools use PLA. In this case, it specified my nozzle type and also my core size. Next set of boxes here, set the layer height and infill control. And so if you want it super smooth and very refined, then you're going to make uh, shorter layers with more infill. But that's also gonna slow down your print time. After that, at the bottom here, this is nice. It tells me how long my prints are gonna take. And in this case, it's gonna take me seven hours and two minutes. And, uh, oh, I forgot. Up here, I've decided I'm gonna use, this, this printer has a second extruder and I'm gonna use support material. Uh, this slows down the printing process quite a bit. Um, when I tried it without the support material for the same job, it only took two hours and 30 minutes. So uh, not quite as pretty results, but a lot faster. And this is what it's gonna look like. So you can see that there's your menu on the right-hand side where you put in all that information. And this image on the left shows the nozzle one material in green and nozzle two, which is the support matrix material in purple and gives you an idea where it's gonna place it. And this is a cool image here, it's called X-ray. 
and it actually breaks down the shapes that build your STL files. So, you know, this one here you can see our, our rectangle with the rounded corners, and there's our uh, ring that we scaled. So it shows you all the shapes that went into your STL file. And then you'll also see what you expect it to look like when you're finished. This is a top view, and this helps you arrange your job, your what the objects you're going to print on the tray. Um, and you can see these are clustered together, and that's going to reduce the travel time with the, the nozzle. If you spread them all out, then it would have to move all over the place to print your, your prints. And there's a picture of the machine I happen to use. It's an Ultimaker. All these machines have similar designs uh, with different refinements. There's a top view and you can see the white material is the support matrix and the green is, the, is what you're building the actual pots out of. And there's a front view and there's the XY tray and it's going to keep moving down as you build the shapes and there's the print head. After we're done, this is what we pull off, our print run. And I just showed three different views. So you can see how it's built up the base. You know, it, they really try and optimize how they use material. You can see it's not a solid blob. There are a lot of triangles here, so that gives it strength and rigidity, but it doesn't waste materials at the same time. And then looking at it from the top, this is a curved pot. The support matrix built inside the pot to make sure that the shape holds nicely. And same thing with the more classic design. This one, the slicer software decided, I don't need any support material. This is gonna hold up just fine. So it's making a lot of pretty intelligent decisions for you. And there's a side view. And I think I flipped this upside down. It should be the other, this one should be the other way around. That's the bottom. Um, Anyway, that gives you an idea of what it looks like, and then of course we're going to immerse them. You know, you don't have to have them in there very long in some warm water. You can start peeling off the the uh, support material. It's basically glue is what you're peeling off. And there's our finished pots. So there's the one with the curved sides. There's the Ikebana pot, and there's our classic pot with their little feet. Then I got to thinking, you know, a lot of libraries don't have support matrix. I really need to print these without support matrix. So I went back to the makerspace and said, can we please do this? And so we did. What it does is it takes that ma same material that you're using to build a pot, but it, it does these fine filaments and those will act as support in lieu of the secondary support material. And this is what they look like. When you get them out of the printer, it, it looks like this. And there's the top view. You can see where it ran some filaments to support the pot on the inside. Um, it didn't do it on the classic pot shape. It, it really was more concerned about the curves. And uh, this is what it looks like on the bottom when you're finished. It, it's going to be messy on the bottom. But typically, people don't care what the bottom looks like. So if you don't mind living with this, then you can do these prints on a single extruder machine and uh, in a fraction of the time. And this is what was left over after peeling all the stuff off. And it didn't take any tools. You can just pick it off with your fingernails or um, a hobby knife. And this is the finished product. And they're not quite as smooth. So you can see there's some bumps here. And if you were concerned, you could sand them down a little bit. You can coat them to make it smooth before you paint them. Or you can just say, hey, these are 3D prints. And this is part of the glamour of 3D printing. And these are interesting textures. Don't forget to dispose of your waste properly. And I mentioned that when we're rotating, we're actually rotating around the y-axis. You can use some commands in your program to set them straight. It's just super easy to also do the rotation with the slicer software, and, and they all do it. Let's look at a curved flower pot now in the turtle program. The code's going to look very different, and this is creating a turtle object and then sending it in different directions. This is what it looks like a little bigger. Th these are some nice tricks. Remember we had to make a hole in the bottom of our pot for drainage. 
If you know uh, Turtle Code, you could start it at the default location at the origin, and then you lift the pen up, and then you would go a certain distance, and you put the pen down again, and you start drawing. Or you can cut to the chase and just give it the coordinates where you want to start. And in this case, we're starting at an x value of 5 and a y value of 2.5. A y, 2.5. And that's because our line is 5 in width. So if you split the difference, you're going to have half of that below the line, half above. And this will sit nicely on the x-axis when you're done. So we're going to draw a line forming the base. And then we'll turn an angle left. And this is an angle you can play with. You can use different degrees. And same thing with the arc. You can really play with those values. And this is how many degrees you're going to turn. In this case, 120. It'll also give you the radius of the turn. And the L in quotation marks just means we're going to the left. After that, I want to make my rim. So I'm going to use the angle command to set the drawing turtle at 90 degrees. And uh, then I'm going to change the width because I want to make that rim a little stronger. I'm going to th thicken it up and go a short distance. Now I have this line. I'll apply my row shell command in, in turtle language. And I can leave it at that. I can just use the T show command to see what it looks like. Or I can export the turtle drawing to another object name and then I can do things with it using plasm commands. So here's a rotate and a show command from the plasm language. And that's how it turned out. Now one thing I noticed about the Python turtle generated pots is they don't have sharp corners. So they have a built-in bevel. And if you want sharp edges you're just not going to get them. But if you like that kind of a uh, little bit of a curve, then this will produce them. You can get pretty elaborate in your programming in Python. You can create functions. You can uh, set parametric variables. These are all skills that you learn towards creating apps. Um, functions are reusable code. So once you have a set of code that you really like how it works, it does what you want to do it every single time then you can write it as a function. You define it as a function, and then you just call that function in your main program and give it the numbers you want to use. And those are called arguments. You can also set parametric variables ahead of your code. So if you want to not mess with your code, but just change, say, how long a line is or how you're going to turn the angle, you can set those as parametric variables. And these are both really nice skills to acquire because you're protecting your code. When you make changes, you're not messing with the code itself. You're just giving it new information when it runs. And, and that's how an app works. Every app we use has got a ton of code running that you never see. All you're doing is giving the program some input. So this is a great way to build these skills and try it out on a little flower pot. As I said, I'm sharing a spreadsheet with the files. We save these out of the file menu. All right, if I go to my desktop and I have a file here in Creative Suite and I'm going to open a file. Uh, let's just pick the turtle. And I want to share it with someone. Then I'm going to go to the file menu. Oh, it's not my file. So I'm just going to open a file that I've created because that's the default. So let me just find one that I just did. Okay, there's a flower pot design. Open that. Now it should be opening. Okay, and I'm going to run that and just make sure. Oh, yeah, I really want to share this. But let's me, let me make sure I'm sharing what I think I'm sharing. Boom, there it is. Okay, there's my nice classic pot. And again, you can see these edges are a little bit rounded when we created in the turtle. And I'm going to go to my file menu now. And it says publish to web. There's my link. I'm going to copy that to my keyboard. Then I can just populate a spreadsheet and share it. There's the one I'm building, and I'll share that with you with some nice descriptions that can act as a starting point for your coders. That's uh, a way to share files. And then if you want to do a workshop, it's not that hard to create these. You could 
do it quite quickly. Uh, you can have them mess around with some of the apps that are on the website. These are files that have been created in Plasm and Python Turtle. Make sure that people understand how to save and open a file. Then uh, you could explore some of the sample flower pot files from the spreadsheet or just venture out and start coding your own. Then, of course, you have to export your STL files and you save those. Then they have to be prepped for printing on the slicer. And then there's going to be a break. This is something you might want to do over a two week period where you get things ready and then at your leisure on various shifts, you can print out all the flower pots. So when they come back, they can finish them and decorate them and then just discuss how the process went for them and take a look at each other's pots with the gallery walk and share their files. So basically that's it in a nutshell, is just remember the printing time takes a long time and so you'll have a very necessary break in there somewhere. So oh, that's what we did today. We went over some design principles and what tools you have available to you, uh, how the 3D printing process works, and then we coded a flower pot in Plasm and Python and uh, went through how to prepare and print and finish these pots and uh, some ideas on how you can plan an event. And of course, I'm going to publish the webinar and uh, the slideshow itself and the spreadsheet and any other materials I can think of. And they will all be available on the community page. You can always reach anyone at NC Lab through support at nclab.com or you can contact me uh, via my email if you like to do that. All right, where do I get the shapes that are available to use? Oh, let me show you that. And I got to tell you, when I did this with my fourth graders, the moment they discovered the list of commands, I gave up on teaching them anything. They just wanted to play. Um, I'm going to open up Plasm, 3D modeling, Plasm. This is the help menu. And you can see there's a list of commands. It has an index or a table of contents, I should say. It'll teach you how to build all the shapes and what to do with them. Like, for instance, that scale command is right here in this list of commands. And what I always do is I use Control F and I'll put in uh, scale. Oops. Scale. Okay, and oh, there's a bunch of them. Let's see here. There's, there's the scale command, and it's going to teach me exactly how to write the scale, how to stretch it, how to shrink it, and, um, and how to do it in 3D. So um, it's right there. It's right there in the app. You have this list of commands, and you can play with it. If you want to get a deeper understanding, you should explore the courses for some excellent instruction and good examples on how to use the commands. Well, good. I'm glad I could answer your question. And uh, thank you so much for coming to the webinar today. And we'll see you in about three weeks. I'll send out a message on the new topic and also an email on uh, when this is all published to community so you can grab those materials. So have an excellent day and we'll see you next time.